Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our talk. My name is Nima Caviani, and I'm here with my colleague Morgan Bauer. We're from IBM, and we are going to present Blockhead Service Broker, which some of you probably have got a sense of today at the keynote. So hopefully we're going to expand on it and go into the more technical details in this talk. Um, and then we're going to show you a demo, a hope, which hopefully will go as good as the keynote demo went. So let's cross fingers. All right, so how do you code for blockchain? Uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, coding for blockchain requires a lot of knowledge that you have to have about the blockchain network. You have to know how to bring up a network. You have to know how to create an account on it. You have to, or even import an account, if you will. You have to have a smart contract or write a smart contract. You have to deploy the smart contract into the blockchain. You have to get the deployed API or application binary interface out of it plus some other information, export all of that to a Web3J applications or basically uh, a decentralized app, as they're called. And then you have a smart contract application. And then you deploy the app on something like Cloud Foundry, and then you have to manage it and scale it. Or if you don't uh, deploy it to Cloud Foundry, you have bigger problems, because you really have to manage it and scale it. So the motivations that we had for the broker was that we wanted to simplify this entire process. We wanted to do that. But basically, allowing the, the platform, a platform like Cloud Foundry, to do a lot of the um, labor work for you and automate it and essentially hide away all the complexities of dealing with the blockchain network when you're writing Web3 applications and make it so that the application developers for blockchain can already assume that the blockchain network is there. And that's a big advantage for them because we're going to hide away all of the complexity that otherwise they have to deal with. So, that way, we wanted to manage the contract lifecycle. So basically, bringing up a node, creating a, um, a contract, and basically an account address, deploying the contract, all of that we thought we could automate. And then possibly make it available for production use, so that if you want, you can connect to public blockchains. You can actually have a full ledger in there. You can submit transactions and basically get verified for the transactions, et cetera. And then we wanted to make it available for a variety of different blockchain networks. So Ethereum, Stellar-based networks, and permission-based networks like Hyperledger Fabric and the other ones. So the vision that we have, ultimately, is that if at one point blockchain becomes the de facto standard for doing this type of transactions by the industry, we want to make it as easy as possible for any developer to be able to jump on and start building applications that have blockchain supported. And basically, provide blockchain as a data store to the application, similar to how a lot of developers do not think about databases when they start writing any sort of application. They just assume that it's a technology that's there and is, it, it works. And if they want, they can create tables and you know, do any sort of transaction with a database. So that's how the blockchain broker was born. And the way we provisioned it was that we assumed that you have a PaaS platform, like Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes, and that's where you deploy your decentralized application. There you're going to have a broker that basically communicates with um, a node management system, which basically takes care of managing your blockchain node, and a deployer that basically makes sure your contracts are getting deployed to the blockchain network. So the broker, the way it works, is that when you create the service, the uh, platform, like Clark Foundry, for example, it talks to the container manager interface. And the container manager interface brings up a blockchain node. Now, that container manager interface can talk to anything, like a Docker machine, like Docker Swarm, like Kubernetes. And all it does is that it brings up a blockchain node. In our case, in this case, what we've implemented right now is the node is an Ethereum node. And it connects you to the Ethereum network. So then you have a node as part of the bigger network that is running. And then in the next step, once you bind that uh, service that gets created by the broker to your application, you also provide it with a contract, with a smart contract. And the broker takes that smart contract, deploys it to the node that it created in the first step, and provides all the information in terms of how to communicate to that contract back to your application so that you can get the application binary interface and talk to your node directly. And from that point on, you're hooked with the blockchain network, and you can do your blockchain application programming, whatever you, you want to do. So with those three simple steps, we kind of simplified something that required a lot of understanding 
and knowledge about blockchain, and a lot of configuration that had to be done up front in basically three commands that the service broker exp exposes to you. Create service, bind service, and then delete service. So we made some, of the de some design decisions along the way. One of the design decisions that we made was to make the broker stateless, in the sense that the containers that it brings up, it doesn't keep any reference to these containers. Um, the only reference is the instance ID that comes along with the request to create a service to the broker. And we use that ID as the name of the node that we create uh, as part of you know, the container uh, or the node management service that Kubernetes and Docker and the other um, container management systems provide. So that way, the next request that comes in with the same ID to request and that requires you to do something with, with that node, you already know which container you need to contact. Right? And that way, we don't have to have any, any database or anything for our broker. And that simplifies the scalability. Uh, because now if you want, if all of a sudden your broker receives a lot of requests, you can just bring up two um, replicas of the broker instance. And since there's no database, no nothing, no syncing or anything is required. It just creates more node, and every, every broker node starts working independently. The other thing that we uh, decided to do was when the container gets created for a node for blockchain, we expose two different addresses. One is the external address uh, of how to access the container, or basically the blockchain node that gets created, and was, one is the internal address that um, basically is you can refer to from inside the container management system. And the external address is for when your distributed app, decentralized application tries to contact the node and does stuff with the node, like, for example, submitting transactions. The internal address is used internally when we bind the service and push your contract into, um, into the node, into the blockchain node. And by using the internal address, the requests for deploying your contracts do not need to go out and then come back, come back in. So if we significantly cut down the amount of time that, it, that is required for um, you know, the deployment of the contracts to happen. So we do two implementations. Basically, there are two ways you can deploy the broker. One is through Bosch. So we have a Bosch release of the Blockhead broker. Um, it's available under Cloud Foundry Incubator. And you can go and deploy it um, as long as you have a Bosch director. You can deploy it side by side with the Cloud Foundry deployment, and then you can create a broker service with reference uh, to the blockhead broker that you deploy. And from that point on, you can use all the Cloud Foundry commands to interact with the marketplace and whatever service that the broker offers. The other implementation that we have is a Kubernetes implementation. And what Kubernetes does is that when you request to create blockchain nodes, it brings up a pod. And the pod has all you need in order to connect that node to the main blockchain network. So for the Bosch implementation, what we used is that for the container management um, system, we used um, Docker. It's Docker machine. So basically, on the VM, we get the Docker machine. And whenever there's a request to create a service, we bring up a Docker machine. The problem with it is you know, there are so many Docker machines that you can create on a VM. Right? So if you have to scale it, it becomes a problem. Uh, and that's why we kind of consider it mostly for de development purposes, especially because if you want a public blockchain node, to run in the Docker container, you're going to have a lot of problems. Because the first issue you're going to hit is that the ledger size for something like Ethereum is 600 gigabytes or more. I think by now it's probably like 700 gigabytes. Um, so having a Docker container with a volume of 700 gigabytes mounted to it, basically, I don't know how many Docker, ball, that Docker containers you can run in one VM. Probably not that many. With Kubernetes, because you get a pod, if you're willing to spend the money, you can actually get a a blockchain node that is synced, um, and that's easier to manage. Um, so the good thing with, the, with Bosch release, though, is, as I mentioned, is that you can, you can deploy it side by side with the Cloud Foundry deployment. And then you can easily create the service broker in, and make it available to Cloud Foundry. And from that point on, there's like two, three commands um, that you need in order to be able to interact with the, with the service broker. So it makes your life very easy. And then once you bind the service, you get all the environment variables for how to interact with the smart contract as part of BCAP services environment variables in your application. So all your application needs to do, the decentralized Web3 JS application needs to do, is to use those environment variables to talk to the contract. 
Um, so very easy to, to deal with. The next thing is the Kubernetes deployment, and Morgan is the expert with Kubernetes deployment, so I'm going to pass it to him. Yeah, I got the computer. I don't sure. need the clicker, I don't think. I'm turn it on. Um, yeah, so Kubernetes, um, I'm not sure how familiar everybody here is with the, with the details of the, the object model and whatnot in Kubernetes, so I've got a quick couple of slides on the details of that and the specific objects that we're using in our uh, broker to deploy it. And uh, I will give you some high-level details and then some more specific details. So uh, we've taken the broker, same thing as the same program as the Bosch release, the Go program. Uh, we've put it into Kubernetes, and then we've uh, exposed the port that it surfaces for, for broker communication. Um, when the broker provisions a blockchain node, we've done the same thing. We provide a service. We provide a service port for the accessing the blockchain node because it services a, a uh, port to connect to, um, and because all of these things are exposed on the uh, public internet, <laughs> public-facing interfaces of the Kubernetes uh, cluster, um, this is the same open service broker API that exists for Cloud Foundry service brokers, and thus you can attach your CF uh, instance to the service broker and proven services bind them. And we have the nice external address that we described earlier that lets every, everybody be contactable. Um, and of course, other platforms that exist that are service broker API platforms, um, such as Kubernetes Service Catalog, SAP has one, Swisscom has one. There's probably more that I don't know of, but there exist multiple implementations of the platform, and this should be compatible with all of them because it's straight open service broker API. Um, earlier we talked about the internal address, the same thing. So if you not only deploy your broker into Kubernetes, but you actually deploy your applications that use the blockchain nodes into Kubernetes, your blockchain applications, your dApps, um, they're also usable, again, on the uh, Kubernetes service object concept. Um, so just Specifics of how the broker is running. The broker uh, is created a deployment, uh, which is creates the pod, and the pod is the you know single unit of running things in Kubernetes. And thus, uh, because we chose the deployment because that you can just say you know give me replicas ten, and then you have ten replicas. And since every uh, everything passes through the the instance name as the identifier passes straight through to the underlying Kubernetes name. Um, you know, there's not really any bottleneck uh, based on the broker. It just goes to whatever, uh, however fast Kubernetes can, you know, operate on the on the API. Um, the Ethereum nodes, the you know, blockchain nodes are directly in a pod because those are basically unique things. And I'm not going to try to scale one instance of a blockchain among multiple pods. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so we don't need the all the deployment management. Uh, Extra, extra logic there. Um, everything is exposed as a Kubernetes service, and that's not a service service. It's really in Kubernetes, it's just a proxy. But what it gives us is it gives us a stable uh, reference point to access everything. You get an IP, you get a DNS entry inside the cluster, and uh, then everything else that needs to reference one of the broker or the blockchain nodes um, has a stable point uh, of reference, and so ingress can just point directly at the service, and then that gets routed to the appropriate pod. Um, another detail is I, we chose node ports, which exposes basically a global node on every port uh, for each specific service. And I did this because uh, configuring ingress is, is unfortunately rather cloud-specific, and you can't just expect the load balancers to, to work with basic configuration. It's usually some special GCP annotation, IKS annotation, AWS, they all have their own specific ingress configuration. So ease of use was the primary thing there, but less sort of scalable in that you have a limited ports for the whole cluster. Um, everything goes into a single namespace. Again, ease of, ease of implementation at the point. Um, the original client we used didn't have uh, the concept of namespaces in it, and I know how to fix that, but for right now, everything just goes into default. It's easy. Uh, again, no ingress. 
Uh, we use the client go cube client, which loads everything from environment variables and uses the service account that is uh, shoved into every pod. Um, I've given the default service accounts uh, extra permissions, but really the only permissions we need are create pod, create service, delete pod, delete service, that's it. Um, we take, using node ports, we get the automatic port mapping, so we don't have to worry about providing a port mapping and making sure it's available. Kubernetes will handle that for us, so that's good there. Um, so I will just deploy the I'll, the, I'll go through the demo now, we're going to deploy a broker in a cube, then we're gonna switch to a different cube that already has everything attached to it. Uh, we're going to run the demo that we ran earlier in the keynote from, uh, which is basically go to CFI, bind the server, or, uh, provision, bind, open up the con uh, smart contract, and if we have time, I'll try to open up Remix, but how do I get that way, okay. So, um, sorry. Um, we can see we have, is that, yeah, I can't really do much about it, but on the left. You can make it bigger if you want. All right, on the left, hopefully we have the sort of uh, Kubernetes kind of stuff that I'm gonna deal with over there, and on the right, we're going to have the, um, well, we're not actually at this one yet. Okay, go to this one, this is the, okay, so this is gonna be the deployment. Um, you can see right now, we've got nothing deployed. Okay, great. Um, I've got a YAML which has the broker's configuration in it. All right, uh, I'll pull that up, but it should be very simple. Everything should go up there, create all the stuff. I can show you the deployment. Um, you can see it's creating the broker. Broker's running, that's basically all there is to see. Um, and you can see everything's configured in sort of a Kubernetes way. We have a config map that holds our configuration with our very secure username and password. Um, we've got the, the one sort of uh, thing we, we made here is that we make sure you have to give it the sort of external name that you want it to be known by because we figure if it's your Kubernetes cluster, you, you own it, you know where it is, and you know how to, how to set that. Um, we can't look it up any other way. Let me see if this works. That, control C, that, oh, what did I do? You jumped out of the box. What is your keyboard? <laughs> it's standard keyboard. Is it? How come it's not typing? All right, so I made a wish earlier today that hopefully it goes as good as the earlier demo. Maybe not true. Maybe a new one? Yeah, I don't know. I <laughs> yeah, so I think that is all right. Then we're back in here, but we don't have any of the exports. Okay, so. well, okay. Um, <laughs> BXES cluster config. Mm, let's go straight to that. Um, which one's split. copy and paste? Control B. Okay. Control B. Okay. I just want to hit that and that exited everything. Yeah, I don't know what happened. So I think we're getting the the cluster information from soft layer, uh, just trying to connect to the cluster, um, and then we can. Control or command? I mean, like, if you do uh, command C, and then command B. I hit that, and that, that exited me last time. Okay. Um, BX, uh, BXCF apps, we should have the, how do I configure this? CF apps, just do CF apps. Oh, CF apps, okay. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so th these are the things that we ran earlier. Vote was the one from the keynote. Um, we have t 
two new ones that are running, and KVOTE is the one we're going to use, and B uh, CF services, we do that, we get the services, okay, so now we get not that one, is it? It's on right here. Where'd it go? Oh, okay. There you go. Um, we need to... Create a service. Is it not bound? No, this one. Okay. Yeah, but rename it, maybe. <coughs> oh. Uh, which one is the... That's the guest dev. That's... Yeah. And then... All right, we're gonna make a new one, and then I will show you the... So that created the pod. So we should see a new pod, okay? That's the pod name. And lucky for us, it starts with a letter. So I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> Maybe let me split the screen so that you can... Oh, you changed it again. Just. I swear, I can't win. Okay. Oh, I don't know. Never mind. Just okay. <laughs> anyway, so we have the service provisioned. So now we need to bind the service to the app. And should I use the K vote or in K vote? Sure. I mean, you probably need to. I mean, to push a new app and then bind it to the. Thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, where's how do I get to the where it is? Yes. Okay. So we can do CF push. And then we'll do a new one. No start. Dash dash no start. Oh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> so we'll push the existing contract app. Should be already up there, so I guess it should be in the cache. So while Morgan doing it, let me just give you a quick overview of what's happening here. Uh, so basically, we showed you that we created a broker, right? And we showed you that we created it through um, the Kubernetes deploy command. So we have the broker, and now we've bound that broker to a Cloud Foundry deployment, which is running somewhere else. And that's the important thing. Like, you can run the broker one way, and as long as it's hooked to a Kubernetes cluster or a Docker engine, then you can reference it, as, and as long as that broker is publicly accessible, you can actually bind it to a Cloud Foundry deployment or a Kubernetes deployment. So from that point on, when you create a service, and that's what Morgan showed, it basically, in this case, because it's a Kubernetes deployment of the broker, it creates a pod, and that pod is the node that is connected to the blockchain network. Mm -hmm. So here, what we created was an Ethereum network in a developer mode that is listed in the pod, and then what we're trying to do is that now we're trying to bind the contract to that node um, that is running, to that dev node, that dev, no dev Ethereum node that is running. So earlier, when he showed the list of pods and the new pod popped up, that was basically the Ethereum pod in the dev mode that was up and running. Right, so you can see the pods. And if we do logs real quick, I did? Oh. <sighs> Do I need to, what is it, unbind service? Do to do, oh. Too fast. And I need all this other stuff right here. And 
we look at the logs, we should see there's a new log bit. So the last thing we saw was right there, 54, and now it's 58. And so you can see it deployed the contract, uh, created it, sealed it, and we're ready to go. Um, so then... Maybe let's have that running, and then we can hit the app and show that. Yep. The actual uh, so it is CF start. CF app. Yeah, CF start. So now it should pick up the binding, which is the contact information for the node that is running in Kubernetes in IKS. And then it's going to do a bunch of stuff, I guess. Right, I know what to do. Yep. If you do control B, B, does that work? No, I don't know. I pressed one button and I destroyed your entire Tmux. It's never going to be the same. Go and node in here. So you see it's pulling all the staging stuff, which is, since it's a node app, it's actually been quite a, quite a bit of work when it's doing the staging of the application. Getting, and if you've, if you've done any development with Web3.js, oh, our battery. Okay. If, um, if you've done Web3.js deployment, and then one thing that you're going to see is, uh, you've noticed is that Web3.js is actually a huge library. It has a lot of dependencies. It has Python dependencies. It has, like, um, so that's a problem with deploying Web3.js apps. There is a, quite a long time that it takes for the app to be staged because it needs to get all the dependencies, do all the NPM install and everything. But it looks like after all the hiccups that we had for the demo, we bound the service, um, we started we the application. <laughs> And here is the version of the app similar to the one that we demoed. The interesting thing that we can show you here, looks like we can show you here. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. Um, Come on. Let's try again. Let's is the other way. that it actually writes to the pod, if it writes to the pod, String has which the remains to be seen, apparently. <laughs> So I, I apologize know. for the demo. We tested everything like five minutes before, but this is with the long, right, with the with the live demos. Um, it's a real demo, it's not a fake demo. It's, it's absolutely real. Everything is real. Um, so, and that's what you get out of when you do stuff real. Yeah. So, anyhow. Do you want to close for some more questions? Or? Yes, of course. Yes. All right. Apologies for the for the cups, but if you have any questions. Do you have some final slides or? Uh, we've got. Uh, we accomplished what we accomplished. We, you know, we did rewrite a simplified version from Ruby to Go. Um, with the next one, with the next. Yeah. Right. Please go visit all the stuff. Questions, yes, Chris, and then here. All right. Chris, you have the answer. Let's go look here first. He, he can talk to it anytime. Absolutely, yeah. There. So great work that you guys did. Nice, nice stuff. Thank like you. my question is, um, the open broker is, is cool, but I'm more, more interested like about the, the, the full nodes, like in the Kubernetes. So like um, by developing some blockchain applications, I see that the concept of a full node being healthy or not depends. Like for example, like if your um, application is uh, sensitive, sensitive of uh, having the latest block or not. So like, um, did you took a look like how you can uh, detect or balance uh, to, the, to, to, to your pool of full nodes uh, in Kubernetes, like uh, yeah, this this uh, full node is, is is up to date, or it's uh, 30 minutes behind, or I don't know, like some conditions of of the network. Did you think about this? Uh, do you think that that's a problem? I would yeah, like your opinion. That's a good question. I think like having a sync ledger in place um, for when you deal with the public blockchain is definitely an issue. One thing that we've tried to do, uh, one thing that we've tried to do is like for the purpose of um, the work we've done so far, kind of steered around the problem by basically running the nodes in dev mode. And 
so when you run dev mode, the first thing that it brings up is the genesis port. So yep. basically you get a fresh ledger. And it's because you're the only node that's basically interacting with that ledger. Um, everything is up with it. So you're not going to run into that problem. When it comes to the pool node, though. Yeah, like uh, for the public blockchains, I mean. Yeah, yeah. So for the public blockchain, when it comes to the pool node, there's a couple of things that we've done. One thing that we've done is that we have looked into the possibilities of having a warm ledger. So basically, we have something on the side that tries to constantly sync in the ledger for a Docker image. So basically, what we do is that we create, um, we we constantly snapshot the images from a run, from a running node, which we presumably assume that it has like the latest version of the ledger, and then we upload the images to a, a Docker image registry. So when it comes to starting a node, we pull that hoping that it will be the latest version of the image. Okay, so just a follow-up like question then, my last one is um, assuming that you have, okay, you, you do all the snapshotting on all stuff, but um, if you have like a lot of customers, you're gonna need a lot of nodes, and you cannot point to the same uh, uh, chain. You have like two separate. Right. So like what I was meaning before is that when you, once you have like pool, and then you do some balancing, like because you have to do it, some, some balancing, you have to consider also, for example, this node here is behind 30 minutes, or like uh, 100 blocks, 1,000 blocks, whatever, because it's heterogeneous, like depends on the network conditions, depends on consensus, et cetera. So, um, like my, my, my question is, did you th consider this? Like, do you plan? Do you think that this is important, is, is, is relevant or not? Yeah, because I think having the, the off the ledger. Switch your mic on because it's, rec it's being recorded. Sorry. Oh, is it? Oh, there you go, it's on, it's on now. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, to answer your question, we haven't done anything about it just yet. We know that you know having a public and up-to-date ledger is critical to a lot of the applications, a lot of the blockchain applications out there. Um, but no, we don't have anything yet. Yeah. Chris has notes. <laughs> notes. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if this was just the CF implementation, but you mentioned the instance ID being like having almost to remain unique. Or remain. Uh, is that the case? Like you, well, you I mean, like that's one part that service broker assumes, right? That the, the instance ID is supposed to be unique uh, for the services that you create. That's basically the part the of this. The instance ID is tracked by the platform. Right. It's a platform value. It comes from the platform. The platform generates it, tracks it. We, we, don't, we don't care what but it, it is. It didn't, oh, so you don't rely on that being stable throughout? I thought it's that's what the, the same, slide was kind of saying. It's the same instance. It's, that's the instance ID. I don't... What do you mean by change, stable? So uh, in the How would it change? Where Kubernetes would reschedule it somewhere else, the instance ID should change. No, it's, it's got a pod name. The pod's going to have a specific it's name. basically similar to his questions. So it means that if that pod crashes or something, you have to reschedule. And my question is, when you reschedule to any other pod, like what are like the the health uh, algorithm, or it should not be round hop robbing for blockchain, you know? It, it's not enough. So like what, so yeah. Uh, oh, I see, when the service gets a different instance ID, what do you do, what your application does? Is that your question? Like if the well, service- Well, when, 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 if a pod gets descheduled and it comes back, right? how, how does it know, how do we, we, we don't do any health check reporting. Yeah, we don't do anything about time. it just now. So maybe There's you can nothing. just use labels, right? Yes. And then that way I you mean, can just discover having your way, The only thing is that you, know, you, you add a database and basically have a way to correlate. That's right. right? Meet that we have labels. Yeah. Yes. yes. But that's a good point. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Nobody? <laughs>